Uh, okay. So, welcome back um, to our third panel, which is uh, headlined Jobs and the Economy. Um, and as before, we have three speakers. We'll start off with my colleague, Ed Poole, um, who's a lecturer in Politics and International Relations. Uh, and we'll then have speaking for Remain, um, Lord David Wigley, Applied Cymru, and speaking for Leave, we'll have Berwyn Davis. So, first of all, uh, Ed. Well, Dr. Vaur Roger, Dr. McCavler, I shall get a heno. My name is Ed Pool. I'm a lecturer in politics and international relations at the Wales Governance Centre at Cardiff University. And one of the areas of my work is in political economy, particularly with a Welsh focus, given the nature of our centre's research. But obviously, with a topic like jobs and the economy in the European Union, there's always too much to talk about in a five-minute slot. It's just such a vast subject of which there's lots of people with different interests in those areas. So. What I'm going to try and focus my words on today is a bit more specifically about the budget and some of the impacts uh, that, uh, that some of the contributions that Wales makes to the EU budget and some of the programs that Wales receives back in return for contributions um, to that budget. Um, the EU budget as a whole is set in multi-year periods. It's about 900 billion euros uh, for the period between uh, 2014 and, and 2020. In fact, that, this negotiation was the very first time that actually that had been a uh, reduction um, in real terms agreed um, by the heads of government uh, when they were setting um, that budget. That's about 100 and, 130 billion euros a year across um, Europe. So members states contribute about 99% of that budget. Um, it's, it's roughly in relation to the size of their economy. Um, and so the UK, uh, you'll know about the rebate. Well, the rebate is a, is a, is a, is a, a reduction in the UK's uh, contribution. It's unique amongst the EU in the size and scope um, of that rebate. So the UK is... Uh, it's always been a net contributor uh, to the EU, and it, at the moment, I mean, in real terms, it's the second largest co uh, net contributor um, in, uh, into the European budget. But actually, it, on the flip side, uh, it, its share on a, per, on a, on a, on a share of um, gross national income is actually one of the smallest uh, 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 net contributions into the, into the EU budget. That's partly due to the rebate, and it's partly because the UK doesn't contribute uh, in areas that it's opt out of. So some of those justice policies that we were talking about earlier, Schengen uh, and, some, uh, and some of the areas. So if it doesn't participate, it doesn't pay into the, into the programme. But on the flip side, again, the UK has the lowest per capita receipts um, from the EU budget of any of the 28 uh, member states, despite being uh, far from the, the wealthiest. And we estimate uh, in a, a Wales Governance Centre report that we released a couple of weeks ago um, on the website, you should take a, take a look at it if you can, uh, th that the UK as a whole made a net contribution to the budget of about $9.8 uh, billion uh, in 2014, which is quite a substantial a contribution in return for some of the benefits uh, that it receives. But this is where the story gets interesting, because the position of Wales is very, very divergent to that of the UK as a whole, particularly in terms of England um, and Scotland. England is a significant net contributor uh, to the European budget. But because of the presence of two major European programmes, namely the structural funds and the common agricultural policy, in fact, Wales itself is a net beneficiary of being um, in the e European Union. We estimated that net benefit uh, to be £245 million pounds, uh, per year, which is about £79 uh, per person uh, per year. Uh, so I just wanted to talk a bit about these two uh, policy areas because they're actually really interesting because they both relate to devolved subject areas, uh, namely uh, economic development and agriculture. So in the event of Brexit, it would be quite very significant impact on the policies of the Welsh Government uh, in those particular uh, two uh, areas. So the structural funds are uh, aiming across the EU to, uh, the aim is to reduce um, economic uh, disparities across uh, the EU as a whole, um, and its regions are, are categorised according to their level of development, and they receive allocations of budget resources um, from up to three different levels of need. And as you may know, West Wales and the Valleys uh, region, which covers quite a large uh, section of Wales, is a recipient of the highest um, area of lead need because it's slipped 
slipped below 75% of, of European-wide uh, 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 GDP. Um, in East Wales, where we're in at the moment, uh, there's also a recipient of funds, but not uh, at that maximum uh, level. So uh, and the current programming period, which is between 2014 and 2020, uh, Wales is being allocated 2.4 billion euros, and that represents about 20% um, of all the funding under this policy for the UK as a whole. So it's quite a, a large amount of money that is that is uh, comes through uh, this policy. So in the event of uh, of withdrawal from the EU, uh, there would be either a substitution of these funds or a, 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 a very substantial change um, in policy. On the common agricultural policy. It's about 260 million uh uh, pounds per year comes into Wales uh, through through that policy. It's often uh, perhaps quite disparagingly referred to as a kind of a, a policy designed um, for kind of the French smallholders, uh, inefficient. But actually, w w in the native industries in Wales, quite actually more similar in many ways in terms of the small holding, uh, sheep farming, hill farming, and so on. So the common agriculture has, has been uh, uh, quite somewhat targeted at those smaller uh, potential businesses, which is why 240 40 million comes um, through that particular policy. Again, you see the very big discrepancies, perhaps, between different parts of, of the, e, uh, the UK um, in the event of withdrawal or a remain uh, vote. Uh, there's, there's really too much to talk about on jobs and the economy uh, in the first five minutes. Obviously, just other, other uh, things to think about, maybe just get questions later on, perhaps, of the impact of the single market, which is kind of uh, uh, reduces barriers to regulation for businesses trading across Europe. Obviously, also makes uh, the, the competition uh, heightened in Wales as well, so maybe works uh, two, two ways. And in the event of a withdrawal vote, I think there's been lots of different solutions proposed for different arrangements that might happen uh, with, 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 the, uh, with the rest of the EU in the event of a leave. Um, in both the Norway and Swiss model, they're perfectly, you know, they're workable models for those two countries, but it's important to recognise there is a net contribution made by those two countries to be um, in those agreements. So it's not the same as the current level of net contribution. Uh, some economists reckon and the Norway model would be about 75% of the UK's current net contribution. Under the Swiss model, which is slightly less involved, would be about 50% of the net contribution currently. So there are certainly other options that are viable uh, and been discussed out there, uh, but all of them are currently on the table if there was uh, an, an, an attempt to, to get back into the, uh, uh, the uh, European Free Trade Association, for example. They would uh, come with, with some budget impact as well. But obviously lots of discussion, obviously, very happy to take questions at the end. Exactly. Hey, just back yep. yeah. Good. Fine. Well, that's right there. Thank you very much indeed, Dilkhari Aoun, for the invitation to be here. I'm sorry that I had to uh, ask for the thing to be rescheduled because of train challenges and all the rest. Let me make it clear from the start where I come on the European question. My parents lived through two bloody world wars in the last century that tore our continent apart. And I, as a youngster, remember Swansea and Liverpool as burnt-out hulks in the city centres. Never again is that going to happen in our continent. And if we pull down the building blocks for that, we do it at our peril. People say NATO is responsible for keeping the peace. Of course, NATO has an armed role. But much better than depending on the force of arms is that we understand each other and we talk to each other. We know our, each other's problems and we work to, uh, together to eat with each other. That is what Europe is about. Now, I've been asked to speak uh, with regard to the economic interests of Wales. My background was in manufacturing industry, uh, three American companies um, in, on the finance side. Um, and it's interesting to note that there are 200 American companies companies in Wales um, today, and there's some 50 Japanese uh, companies, they're here in order to export to the European Union. They've come here for that purpose. And if we weren't in the European Union, they, w they wouldn't close overnight, but they would be winding down. Um, as the leaders of companies like Toyota and Siemens and Airbus uh, have made clear, if there was a movement away from uh, the European Union, that would have an effect on their um, staff and their future. Uh, and if there was a, a knock-on effect um, from those large employers, Ford's down here, another example, uh, 
many of the small companies that provide services um, for these larger companies would also uh, undoubtedly be knocked. And that is something that we, we've got to remember. Now, that I, some of my friends in the Brexiteers initially said that the UK could get a trading deal um, with the EU as Norway has, as was mentioned a moment ago. And then it was pointed out that Norway has to pay money, as we heard a moment ago, that it has to accept uh, migrants coming in. Uh, if you have a free movement of, of goods, you have a free movement of people as well. And then the emphasis w went away from Norway. And Switzerland was brought forward. And then people found that Switzerland, uh, many of the industrialists and business people in Switzerland want to be members of the European Union. They want to come in. And Switzerland, and they would, of course, have the same uh, uh, rules as Norway would have had to face. Then Canada was suggested as a model. But it took seven years to negotiate the agreement with, uh, w w with Canada. Somebody suggested Albania, if I remember right. Uh, then the Albanians told us we must be half mad to do that. And we can take that as, uh, as we want to. Now then, my belief is that Brexit have comprehensively lost the uh, um, economic argument. And that's why we're switching to be talking about migrants so much these days. And I regret that to a large extent. We heard a moment ago, ago um, uh, oh, incidentally, um, on the manufacturing scene, uh, Professor um, a, uh, Minford here in, in Cardiff, Patrick Minford, said on the radio recently that he accepted that manufacturing industry would have a substantial hit if we left the European Union, but he believed that it was still worth it. Despite that, well, there we are. With regard to agriculture, which was mentioned, 90% of Welsh beef and Welsh uh, lamb products are exported um, to the uh, EU. 90% of our exports go to the EU countries. Yes, we could still sell if we were outside, but we'd have to face tariff barriers, something between 14% and 70%, and that in many instances would make them uncompetitive. 80% of Welsh farmers are dependent on CAP funding. And as we heard, the European Structural Funds will be bringing some £2 billion to Wales in the six-year period up to 2020. And they funded many important projects, the length and breadth of Wales, that many of you know. As indeed, the uh, 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 European Investment Bank has also helped. You think of uh, projects such as in Swansea University. Now, then, what we hear from our friends in Brexit is that, ah, yes, we'll have that £350 million, Oh, perhaps it's not 350 million, perhaps it's half that. Uh, say nine, nine billion a year um, from saving the payments that we make in there. And that is going to fund everything. What's going to be done for the National Health Service, what's going to be done for the farmers, what's going to be done for education, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And if you add up all the promises, it comes to 112 billion pounds to be funded out of this nine billion pound pool. Well, I don't think that arithmetic adds up somehow. I, the European funding, uh, we're told by Brexit, will be made up by Westminster. But I was in the Assembly when the Objective 1 programme first came in. And when we got the Objective 1 programme, uh, initially, we were told, oh, well, Westminster, Whitehall is going to keep the money because you already have a regional policy that we fund. And I had to go out with the team to see Michel Barnier, the regional uh, commissioner at that time, and argue the case with him. Uh, and he was appalled, and he took it up with Gordon Brown, and it led to £442 million pounds being passed over in the subsequent July in the statement made, uh, money that should have come to Wales in the first place, but Whitehall had decided they would pocket it. So don't ask me to say, yes, we can trust Whitehall and Westminster with these funds, that they'll make up everything that we lose from the European Union. What we have, I believe, we ought to hold. But even more important, it's about the prospects for people. How do the people of Wales grow? In terms of the economy, in terms of business people, in terms of having confidence and having the links across the continent in order to make things happen for our economy. It's people that make things happen. And I believe that in the context of the wider Europe, Wales has the best of both worlds. We're able to control what we can control within Wales. And there's some things at Westminster that I like to control. And yes, let's get the subsidiarity argument running so that anything that can be done nearer the people should be done nearer the people. But there are some things, including economic factors that have to be decided on a market-wide basis. And there are other things, as we heard a little earlier from our climate change denier. There are things like the de uh, decisions in relation to pollution of the air or the, or the sea that has to be decided on a wider basis. So yes, let's as much autonomy and self-government here in Wales. Let's do things on a British level that can be done there rather than Brussels. But 
There are some things for the economy and for the future of the lives of our continent that have to be done on a European level, and we need to be in there playing a positive part, not whinging on the fringes all the time, in there giving a lead and building the sort of Europe our people will be proud of. hard act to follow. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. A few words about me. I'm a free trader, I'm an internationalist, I'm a businessman, and I've spent most of the last 30 years outside the UK, in Europe, in Asia, and as you can probably tell, in Australia. Now, first of all, nobody can give you an answer on this with any precision. Certainly not the government. And I think most of us know this. For most of us, the key decision is, on balance, am I and my family going to be better off or worse off in 10 years' time in or out of the EU? My position very strongly is that we should leave with some sadness. I voted to stay in in 1975. Now, let's deal with some of the red herrings. All this European money coming to Wales. There's no such thing as European money. There's taxpayers' money, our money. And UK taxpayers, as we've heard, pay eight or nine billion a year more into the EU than they get back. So there's plenty of money for Carwin to spend. But I don't think this issue of payments is crucial. The sums, frankly, are just not big enough. And I also don't see any real difference between the interests of the UK and Wales. So, European money. Second, trade. The EU takes a large proportion of our exports, about 40%, and dropping. But that trade won't go away. Even if we leave the, U the EU rather, without a free trade agreement, trade will take place under World Trade Organization rules. The average tariff that we would face, according to The Economist, is about 3%. Irritating, not enough to make a critical difference. And by the way, we're big food importers, so all that exported food could go to consumers in England. But that's the worst case, that 3%. Both sides should want a free trade agreement, not a Norway agreement, a Switzerland agreement, a free trade agreement like the EU has with South Korea, Mexico, and now Canada. Both sides should want this, but emotion may get in the way for a few years. But let's not forget, a growing majority of our trade is with the rest of the world. Our interest is in having a strong world trade organization. That's where our diplomatic effort should be directed, not squabbling in Brussels. So money for Wales, trade with EU, not the key issues. What is the key issue? Well, sadly, for 40 years, the UK and the EU have kidded themselves that they wanted the same thing in this relationship. They don't. It's like a bad marriage going wrong. The Brits always been focused on finance, on economic benefits. The European elites, particularly those of France and Germany, see something very different ever closer union. It's in the treaties. Political and economic union in a supranational state. And they're doing a great job of it. 2,000 legislative acts passed by the EU last year alone, all on their website. But this rule-obsessed ever closer union has not been very successful. Over the past five years, the UK has created more jobs than the rest of the EU combined. Britain's been lucky. We've been able to dodge some of the worst bits of the EU because of our opt-outs, above all from the Euro. Now, have you noticed how many of the people who say we should stay in the EU are the very same people who said we should go into the, into the Euro? David Wigley, a man I've admired for many years, just shows that even the best of us don't get it right every time. 
Now, the UK has an economy that enables us to compete effectively. Less regulation, more flexibility, more open to the world. But if we wait to stay in the EU, things will get harder. The pace of ever closer union will pick up, above all, to protect the euro. My fear is that we will suffer a long, slow, suffocating strangulation. And it doesn't have to be that way. The danger is an EU that over-controls, over-taxes, and over-regulates itself near to death. Far better, in my view, to take control of ourselves as a self-confident nation, making the laws we need and trading with the rest of the world under the World Trade Organization rules. We don't have to fear this. We're already doing it. This is what we are good at. It's time to leave. Thank you very much. OK, thanks. Well, I think most of you know the drill by now. Uh, we have some time for questions. Uh, there's a microphone up here for the panellists. Um, so, don't be shy. Gentleman here in the, I think, blue shirt. Yeah. Um, I'd like to ask uh, Mr David, what is the alternative uh, model then for Wales? Um, recent uh, research showed that Wales is up on uh, funding £245 million, with the every single household up £79, I think, better off in the EU. In terms of uh, the jobs linked to the EU in Wales, I think it's around 200,000. What would happen to those jobs? What, is, again, is the alternative model? Um, if we look at the farming industry, um, our farming industry is propped, it's supported by, for over a number of years by the, the CAP and the Rural Development uh, Programme. Um, so I'd just be interested to know um, what is the alternative vision for Wales and uh, why deprive ourselves of a single market with five, uh, 500 million uh, citizens? Thank you. Okay, um, as the question was directed to Berwin, so perhaps you could answer it first and then the other panellists can comment briefly. Yeah. First of all, we're not depriving ourselves of this market. We can trade with it freely. I talk about an average 3% tariff. This is project fear number, jobs linked to the EU. What it means is people who sell something to companies who sell something to other companies who sell something to the EU. It's just nonsense. Wales and the UK have some real problems. Right? We've got some structural problems. In Wales, above all, our public sector, our dysfunctional education system, our lousy health service. If we get those right, we call ourselves a welfare state. We're not. We're a state on welfare. We get subsidies from England all the time. We need a vision, which I don't see coming from Cardiff Bay, to get us off welfare, get us working, get us into the world. That's the only way forward. The role for government in this is to, is to not try and pick winners in industry, not try to protect or shield one group or another, get the basics right, good education, good health service, good infrastructure. Okay. Thanks very much. Uh, Ed, do you want to just comment uh, t t on any of that? Just press the button on the knee. Oh, nobody heard me, did they? We did. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, very briefly then, um, the, you know, I think the numbers in terms of the, the net benefit, and thank you for quoting the Wales Government Centre Research there, uh, are actually relatively small as a percentage of GDP, and I agree with, with the comment there. We talk about 0.4% of GDP. I think the challenge for Wales would be that in any fiscal space created uh, through the, the UK Government not having to make the contributions to the EU, there would be, there would be money, about that 9 billion figure. So it's a real number, it's just whether or not that money would be used for another UK government priority. And so we don't know, you know, the, 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 you know, the primary objective of the current UK government stated in the manifesto is to reduce the national debt and the deficit. Um, and it's, it's, it, there's no guarantee that, that Wales would be able to retain the programmatic funding that is, that is being uh, gained at the moment. So I think that's the concern. The number is, is relatively small as a percentage of GDP though, but in terms of that programmatic element, there's much more uncertainty. Yes, I was very interested to hear uh, Berwin's comments about being too welfare dependent and all the rest. That's how we get the sums to add up, presumably, by winding down the welfare state. NHS, 
and the other important payments that are made. Okay, things may not be run uh, brilliantly very often, either in Westminster or in Cardiff, but my goodness, I wouldn't want the price for us going out of the European Union that we lose some of these uh, policy areas that have been very, very close to the hearts of the people of Wales. I would put it, Berwin, um, to you that it's Brexit that is making the proposal, a proposal to change from the status quo. It's therefore incumbent on Brexit to present a plan with the sums adding up to show exactly how things will be if we follow your course. That hasn't happened so far, and if it hasn't happened in two weeks' time, the proposal deserves to be kicked out lock, stock and barrel. Um, right. next, next question. Uh, we have... Uh, we'll come to you. Um, you'll get plenty of chance to talk, Baron, including wrap up at the end. So I'm, I'm, so, I'm sure you'll get your comment in. Uh, question first, uh, gentleman here at the, uh, at the front in the white shirt. Hi. Um, I mean, my, from my perspective, I'm very much a Eurosceptic. However, the Leave campaign, in my opinion, have not come up with a convincing argument that states that the economy will not be destabilised for a long period of time in the event, or short period, any period of time in the event of Britain leaving the EU. Uh, there's nothing concrete lined up, as um, Lord Wrigley has said. It pays me to agree with the member of Plaid Cymru, but it's true. There's a lot of, I'm a staunch Conservative, but he's, uh, he's um, true that there's a lot of many jobs linked to that. And there is also no, nothing concrete. Bre the Brexit camp haven't got anything concrete lined up. We had President Obama coming over saying that, you know, Britain would be at the back of the queue. We also have lots of heads of state, uh, other heads of state, saying that, you know, that it's not a priority to come up with a trade deal with Britain. And so it, it seems as though I'd really like to, to have, believe in a really convincing economic argument for a Brexit that would not involve the, the instability of the economy. But it seems as though it's kind of quite a pie in the sky thing. And also, um, it kind of, yeah. in, in, in spite of people like President Obama saying, well, Britain would be at the back of the queue, there seems to be this okay. rhetoric it's, it's, that, well. Is there a question here, sir? Uh, yeah, yeah. Basically, it could. Um, could yeah. Just, just, just shout it anyway. <laughs> uh, just, just could Mr. Davis. Uh, Kind of come up with an argument which states there wouldn't be any um, specific, um, yeah, what was I going to say, uh, uh, come back, um, just a um, specific instability in the economy, especially as the Prime Minister and the Chancellor of the Exchequer have expressed deep concerns, you know, regarding the economy in the event of Britain leaving the uh, okay, EU. Okay, thank you. I think it's unfair to have all questions starting with, with, with Barry, and unfair to him. So maybe we'll start with Barry this time and we'll work the other way down the table, please. Uh, I yeah. suppose I say I agree with the question. <laughs> uh, anything further you want to But look, no, the, I, I think you, you commented on the campaign, um, and I think that from both sides of the campaign, it hasn't been as glorious as I would have liked it. I personally would like to have seen a much more positive platform on our side as well as on the Brexit side to be spelling out in greater detail. Um, but nonetheless, the onus does fall on those proposing change. And that's what I think we have a right to expect. And I hope that we will see it. Okay, Ed, any brief comments on that? Sure. Um, I mean, yeah, I mean, it is the, the the level of uncertainty is is somewhat concerning in terms of uh, the the argument. We, if you saw in the past uh, two months, there's been about 65 billion pounds of, of currency leaving the leaving the UK or being converted into other currency. That compares to about two billion in a normal six month period. It was in the uh, the Independent today. Um, so there is uncertainty. Uh, it's not to say, of course, that the, the model the alternative models couldn't work. I mean, Norway has been asked twice to join the EU and have both times rejected that proposal and are currently making uh, you know, quite large net contributions to be uh, a member of the single market. There are, of course, there are uh, other alternatives, uh, but certainly the, on the investor side, the, the withdrawal argument is, is more concerning. And, and I think you see that it, when the opinion poll shows a, a, a swing towards leave, you see that, that effect. So I think in the immediate aftermath of a leave vote, there would be quite considerably economic uncertainty. What the long-term uh, model might be in the negotiations after that might, might make a difference. Okay, Barry, you get the last word this time. Thank you, thank you very much. First of all, is there going to be some short-term disruption? Yes, there is. That's why I said at the very beginning, think in 10 years' time whether you, and your, you expect you and your family to be better off or worse off. And I see arguments on both sides. I voted to stay in in 75. I'm saying this with some, some sadness. But look, think about this like a divorce. If two parties divorce, there's pain on either side and things are rocky for a while. 
Rocky and choppy doesn't mean disaster. I say we continue to trade with the, with the EU on a 3% tariff. Even the pro-EU economists said, not a problem. Most companies cope with that each year in terms of energy price changes, exchange rate changes. So some short-term choppiness, absolutely. Is our GDP growth rate going to be crimped for a while? Yes, it is. We've got to think in the long term. David Wigley is right. Um, I think we have to show there is a strong economic case. Equally, those who want to remain in have to be sure that things are not going to get worse. European border force, European army, we're told, fiscal and banking union coming up. Jean-Claude Juncker saying in private, we are told, there's going to be a big new regulatory treaty coming along. All that's coming down, down the pike. Because if we, if we get out, we're able to come up, as I said, with the rules we want and move ahead. Don't forget, the sums don't, don't, are not that bad at the moment. We pay nine billion more in, we're going to leave, we're going to keep that nine billion. It's, frankly, in a 1.5 trillion economy, it's chump change. But the, the, the sums add up. The, the key question is, do you think you're going to be better off in 10 years, you and your family and your grandchildren better off in 10 years' time, in or out? I think the signs are pretty clear that it's out. But I think if people want specifics, they're kidding themselves. One of the things that has cursed this debate is figures coming from all sides. Anybody can claim anything. We have the Treasury telling us we're going to be, what, 4,000 per household. That's a measure that the government have never used before. Treasury can't forecast government revenues six months in advance but they're going to tell you how wealthy you're going to be in 10 years' time. It's just nonsense. Don't try to make decisions on figures. Make decisions on really your best judgment about the way you think things are going to go. Okay. Thank you very uh, much. Thanks. Um, yeah, gentlemen in the second row back. Thanks. Yes, uh, to some extent, my point or question has just been answered by the gentleman because I remember 1975, sadly, <laughs> and the way things have changed since. And in, in, in fact, the, um, the, the way politicians were quite um, economical with the truth. I can recall uh, Sir Geoffrey Rippon saying there would be no loss of the fishing industry, and we know what happened on that. I watched him on TV doing it. But my question is, the Remainers keep on going on about what will Brexit look like, which, fair enough, there is uncertainty, but there's also uncertainty as what does Remain look like, and it's probably even worse. And it's the fact that we don't... Cameron went about a year back to Brussels, and he was given a bill for £1.8 billion which he said, I'm not going to pay, and then paid it. We d the, the, the economics, um, their review of the budget has been delayed until after June the 23rd, because we don't know what's going to happen. So <laughs> I'd like the panel to talk about the risks of staying. OK, thanks. Uh, perhaps we can start with Ed this time, as he hasn't started yet. So. Um, yeah, I mean, I mean, of course, you know, under any future is, is uncertain. I do think, I mean, there is an imbalance in uncertainty, though. I think the, the withdrawal option is is more uncertain, but particularly related to which which approach to uh, 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 which uh, agreement model would be a, a try would be would be engaged with in Europe in the event of withdrawal vote uh, with the single market or a free trade uh, agreement and so on and so forth. I mean, on the on the just on the single market point, it's not just the tariffs, although you know that that is important. It's also the the uh, the, the regulatory harmonisation, which means that businesses can sell their products in any member state with relatively few regulatory barriers. That's also really um, important in in the single market as well. Okay, thanks. Um, that, that then, well, let's come to bear in this time, and, uh, and then David. So. So, okay. Well, the risk, the, there are risks to staying, as we said, the um, increasing strangulation of, of our economy. Um, the, the, the benefits of of leaving, um, to me, are very much clear. We control our own destiny. The relationship we want with Europe is one of friends and neighbours, a free trade agreement. There are all these red herrings about Switzerland and Norway. And that. We want a free trade agreement. Morocco has one. Singapore has one. Canada's got one. South Korea's got one. They all work very well. I hear what Ed says about regulation. If you sell into Europe, you have to meet European product standards. Not a problem. We meet those already. What you don't have to have is all this weight of European regulation on things 
that have got nothing to do with trade, employment directives, working time directives, environmental directives, garbage collection directives, you name it, they got a directive on it. 2,000 pieces of legislation last year dumped on the British people, put together by opaque committees, complicated, Nobody, most people who don't understand economics. I'm unfortunate today, I'm with David Wheaton, who actually can read a profit and loss account. Most of these, most of these guys can't. They've got no idea of the impact that they're imposing. 2,000 pieces a year, each year, every year. He's glowing with praise for you, David. But anyway, you get the last word this time. <laughs> yes, uh, just about. I, I'm exhausting it. <laughs> um, there was one term that you used: the strangulation by regulation. And then you went on to mention some of these regulations, the regulations that safeguard the workforce against exploitation, that make sure things like parental leave, that make sure that uh, women have a, their fair uh, crack of the whip. These are regulations that are there to ensure that unscrupulous employers in other parts of Europe don't undercut people to, get, to make their profits. They are there for a social purpose. Now then, that's what's changed since 1975. We've seen the emergence of social Europe. And many of the people who voted in 1975 for the common market don't like social Europe. Yes, of course, you can get competitive advantage if you're allowed to trade in a free trade area, but on a different set of rules to those who are there. I don't think for one moment they'll allow you to do so, and you will pay the price. We'll pay the price and the danger is if you had your way that ordinary working people would pay the price as well um, no, okay. we have about time for one or almost two questions and I see at least six hands so uh, for sorry we can take uh, the, 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 uh, the, uh, the, the sorry and um, take the take take the lady uh, sorry, over here y yeah thanks and, and then you sir well, I'm, I'm just a member of the public here, so no uh, political leaning. But I, I have my main concern isn't about whether we stay in Europe or leave Europe. It's about the impact of the referendum on community cohesion. So um, I'm really concerned about the growing level of racism. I'm really concerned about the creation of a new underclass of people who, if they become ill or disabled or lose their job, they won't be able to claim benefits. In part of the, parts of the UK, they won't be able to see a doctor. Um, and there's go, they'll, it'll lead to a growth in the black market economy me, I'd imagine. So my question is, as this is a question, to each member of the panel, so in, in terms of whether we stay in or leave, what, what can be done to repair the damage to community cohesion that's been created by this referendum? Okay, thank you. Okay. So I'm going to take that question as well as the gentleman just, just behind, just there, and you comment on both of them. Okay. Um, I would just like to throw something into the mix, uh, which I haven't heard anybody at any meeting talk about, and that is that in this country and around about and in the UK, there are entrepreneurs. But we, and those people, and ones who are already struggling with businesses and being oppressed by all sorts of legislation and things like this and taking their time up and stopping them actually running their businesses, those people tell me, because I don't like looking at bits of paper and thousands of stats coming from somewhere or other, I like to talk to a human being and find out what the real people got to say. And what those men say is that they want to be out of Europe so that they can trade throughout the world and actually then pay beyond this living wage or whatever wage it is, where you still got to go to the food bank, but have a proper wage because they want people to work, they've got, they'll get the contracts, they'll get the work, and they'll pay those men and women that they're employing good money. I'm going back to the days of um, Ken Rogers. Some people might have known him, but he was that sort of guy. But he was always battling the establishment. Okay, that's okay. all for the minute. Okay, th thank you very much. So it's two somewhat contrasting comments. I'll uh, just have uh, the panel talk about them. Thanks. Um, yeah, start with David here and work away this way down. Sorry, um, it's not just a staff question, but I don't know why, so we might have to keep... They're all dead, are they? Can you hear my voice anyway? Yes. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I was lucky in that area of life. Um, I can pick up the three points the lady made a moment ago. Um, yes, the question of cohesion after this is an important one, particularly if there's a perception 
that there is, and perhaps not intended to be, but an undercurrent of racism running through the thing. And people who are immigrants, migrants coming here, are going to be weak, are going to feel susceptible, and their commu communities that associate with them are likewise going to feel this. And somehow or other, we've got to avoid that. Whatever the uh, economic arguments are, we must not turn it into a blame culture, blaming migrants and immigrants and all the rest. Get the rules right by all means and are fair to everybody. With regard to disability, you mentioned an excellent um, a conference was held in Parliament yesterday. How old Kerry Jones was uh, with us was presenting um, some of the work that he and my colleagues um, had done on the importance of the European Union for disabled people, an area very close to my heart. Um, and the way the European Union led to the United Nations developing its own convention on the uh, rights of uh, people with disabilities. So that area is important, and we must not move back backwards um, as a result of uh, um, this phenomenon. Uh, the gentleman behind you, uh, with regards to what business people say, that they will then have the opportunity to export to the rest of the world. They have that opportunity now. There's nothing stopping them doing so. They can get on with it. The change with regard to Europe doesn't change that. I understand the frustration with um, regulations. And there are some regulations, undoubtedly, that should be challenged, and we should do a better job of it. We don't do a very good job in Westminster either of yeah. challenging regulations. So much goes through on the knob. The vast majority of stat statutory instruments can't be amended even by either House of Parliament, the Democratic or the Democratic, where, 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 where I am. So, yes, there's a need there. I was chair of a small company which we set up in 1979. I was chair for 11 years, building up from employing one person to employing 50, merging with a company from the United States, and then it's now Siemens have taken over in Tamberis, um, employing 400 people. Now, then, that, that I know the challenges of the bureaucracy and that sort of thing, and the risks that people have to take. But it's much better to be doing that when you have a level playing field and you understand the rules which your competitors, competitors are working with as well. And I believe that the European Union provides that and that there's a net benefit. I understand the point, but I think it's a balance. Uh, Ed, we, we seem to be in shouting mode or something, or if you can try and get the microphone working. Uh, Ah, there's the light. There. Um, yeah, yeah, I mean, just in terms, in just somewhat briefly on the on the referendum campaign issue. I mean, it's you know, I think, I think everybody after the referendum would like to see things normalise somewhat. I think the stakes are really incredibly high in this particular referendum. I think we need to see you know, uh, the evidence from voter enrolments yesterday. I think turnout, uh, you know, is is edging up. I think people are engaged and want to have a say. And I, and I think you know that's. Uh, generating some of these of these conflicts, uh, uh, perhaps. I mean, on, on the regulation issue. I mean, uh, certainly. I mean, there's there's certainly complaints uh, from business. Uh, business owners about the level of regulation. I mean, farming, for example, can be feel more more like accountancy than uh, than rearing uh, than rearing farming uh, agriculture at the moment. But I, I do think, I mean, the the reason for it, of course, is th to have the the level playing field with the rest of the single market, is so that you, know, you can have a, the, the farmers, um, you know, trading can. can can compete on a, a level playing field with, with farmers and other businesses uh, across the EU. So that, that's the reason for it, but absolutely it, 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 is, it is burdensome, no doubt. Okay, thanks. And, and Berwin. Thank you very much. Well, there were... Yeah. No, let's give up. Okay. <laughs> there, were two, there were two comments. One, entrepreneurs are for Brexit. Yeah, hooray for that. Um, community cohesion, uh, very important. I think many of the divisions will heal themselves quite quickly. Um, on the issue of an underclass, let's be clear, it's Europe that's got the underclass right now. 20, 40 percent youth unemployment in places like France, Italy and Spain. I've just come back from Australia. Sydney's full of Italians emigrating there because they can't get work at home. Britain takes in a net 300,000 migrants every year. People coming here to look for work. In a few years' time, we're going to have a nine-pound minimum wage. That's more than the average wage in many, Euro in many EU countries. So for Lord Wigley to twist my words to suggest <laughs> there's going to be a problem being up against this, uh, a, a debt politician, to, to suggest, though, that there's going to be no social protection in uh, a Brexit world re really, really isn't true. The best protection we can have is a well-working, free-trading economy We've already got half of that, and we can we can see we can see the benefits. So I think if you want to have an underclass, by all means, adopt this social Europe and the euro. That'll be great. 
Okay, do, um, final, brief, um, final brief comments from um, uh, the panel. Uh, Ed, first of all, as, as he started off, um, just about 30 seconds or so. Just sure. um, I mean, I just uh, uh, thank you for you know, the really interesting uh, discussion we've had. Um, it, I, I think just going back to the initial point is that the numbers are quite important, uh, that, that there will be consequences. I, I think that's right, but it will remain more a leave vote. The, the position of Wales is different from that of the, the EU, the UK, excuse me. Uh, the UK is a, is a significant net contributor, no doubt. Uh, to, to being part um, of the single market and, and the European Union. The position contrasts in Wales uh, because of Wales' receipt um, of very significant funding. So I think the, the question uh, is perhaps uh, uh, from Wales Governor Centre, it's, it's uh, an, an interesting point is how this debate uh, is different um, in Wales. I think some of that has come out tonight. Okay. Uh, David, final comments from you? Yes, indeed. Um, Clearly, there are areas where one has to make one's best guess. There are areas where the facts are available. In those areas where the facts are available, people won't trust politicians using them. So what we have is institutions, whether it's the Bank of England or international institutions, bringing forward their own facts to tell the story. Then they're rubbish. It seems that facts are rubbish unless they happen to agree with the Brexit side. Now, that all I ask, again, is that Brexit brings their blueprint for us to consider um, in detail. But I would appeal to everybody, when the decision is made, it's not finally on the last function of the pets. It's finally on what sort of a Europe we want to see for our children and our grandchildren. And I am totally convinced that it is in the interest of the next generation in Wales and Britain and throughout Europe that we work together to build a harmonious continent in which hopefully we can be prosperous, happy, and also enjoy social justice. Thanks. Um, and finally, Bevan. There can be bipartisan agreement. I agree with Lord Wigley. It's about the kind of Europe and country we want in 10 years' time for ourselves, for our children, and our grandchildren. But remember, nobody can give you answers with any precision. Asking for Brexit to bring a fully worked up case really is a red herring. The Treasury have given you one, nobody believes it. Professor Patrick Minford and his colleagues, you might want to look at the website, we've had one mentioned earlier today, <laughs> www Economists for Brexit, will give you an excellently worked out example that says we'll be better off. You pays your money, you takes your choice. It's not a question about numbers, it's a question about feel. And I think we face a clear choice between ever closer union and a supranational state and setting our own path as a confident trading nation. Ever closer union has a clear... Right, something going wrong? <laughs> ever closer union has a clear danger that we will be dragged down. It offers few benefits that we won't get from trade under WTO rules. Leaving the EU will involve a choppy few years as we disengage, but the long-term prospects are much brighter. Many other medium-sized nations and economies do very well without the glories of EU legislation. We will too. This is what we are good at. Thank you very much. Cheers. Thank you. Okay, and now it's my job to bring things to a conclusion. It's been quite a long and rather warm evening, so thank you all for sticking with it. Um, may I thank um, Manon for organising and also doing sterling duties with the microphone. Uh, and hope you join with me in thanking all of our speakers on this panel and those earlier as well. Thank you.